it's not yeah so now we are connected so um hello everybody and welcome to the third seminar uh on the 10x genomics and single cell technology so i'm gonna start um in a couple of minutes so everybody joins and they will have a little bit more time for uh everybody to join it's 10 o'clock so we can wait a couple of minutes people is connecting so just for um to start with um just saying that today's uh seminar is um the topic is oncology and cancer biology and um, we have today Dan Carter from the um, School of Biomedical Engineering and also has a conjoint appointment with uh, or joint appointment with the Children's Cancer Institute at UNSW. So um, he's going to be the invited speaker for today. And um, as usual, we're going to start with uh, Yvonne Peterman, which she is the I'm going to, this today, I'm going to say your title properly. It's the Science and Technology Advisor for 10X. Um, and, um, and then she's going to tell us a little bit on um, the 10X, I guess, portfolio and solutions and, you know, highlight a few of the applications that 10X can offer for oncology and cancer biology. And then we'll follow on the um, Dan, um, Dan's uh, talk, uh, focus on neuroblastoma. So let's wait a couple more minutes to have more people coming, slowly coming in. Um, so yes, I guess, um, we can we can start with the introductions. So um, as I said before, Yvonne is the um, science and technology advisor for 10X, and she is um, currently based in Melbourne. So she joined 10X earlier this year. Is it earlier this year? Yeah. Uh, but she has a wealth of experience on genomics technology. She's been in in a, a few companies. Um, uh, and then she, she has a lot of experience on that. And uh, today she's going to share a little bit of the applications for 10X uh, on the, on the, uh, on the uh, portfolio of 10X for solutions for oncology. Now I would like to remind everybody that you, the questions will have questions at the end, uh, both for Yvonne and Dan and any technical questions that you might have or questions about the facility at UTS, um, anything that you, you are, you know, like any question, we'll have a bit of a time at the end of the, of the seminar. Uh, but in the meantime, you can, you know, please, please um, feel free to post your um, questions in the chat. Um, it's not, a, not, not, you know, like a, as, as they go, so you don't forget um, once you have the question and then we will be addressing those ones at the end of the seminar. So I think that's a bit of a four minutes past 10. So I think we can start with uh, Yvonne's uh, talk. Uh, over to you, Yvonne. Thank you very much. Hi, thanks, David. Thanks for the introduction and good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our uh, third seminar this morning. And I want to take the first 20 minutes uh, to give a quick introduction on some of the, uh, the key technology platforms that 10X Genomics has and some applications uh, for you know, cancer oncology in, in general. And I wanna to start today with this sort of timeline of innovations that, that 10X um, has released since uh, its beginnings in 2015. 
And, you know, as, as David said, I joined in the beginning of this year and it's actually been absolutely incredible, uh, not only to, to learn uh, what these uh, already launched uh, solutions do, but also witness since then some of the new um, launches that we've had and, and how these technologies advance all these different um, fields. Um, and specifically today with the focus of oncology, um, it's the field is, um, you know, tremendously moving uh, utilizing some of these uh, technologies here that you see. Uh, we, we can't really go into all of them, but I have picked a few uh, of these um, solutions. So the single cell gene expression solution, um, the, the immune profiling solution, and specifically also our Visium spatial gene expression solution. And we'll just um, show you some examples of how they can be utilized. And what's actually really highlighting uh, the single cell application and, and what how it changes discovery and treatment for cancer was uh, quite well highlighted in this publication here in, in, in Science in 2018, where they really focus on the different techniques and what they actually advance in the field of, um, of cancer, specifically uh, tumor profiling um, using single cell technologies and that's really seen as paving the way for many more discoveries that will come from these improved technologies and obviously they are all you know they're not perfect they all have some form of limitation but I think where we're at right now um, the advances that that can be achieved I think are, are quite tremendous and some of those I'll, I'll highlight today as well. And to begin with, again, um, showcasing you the, the sort of the main technology platforms that 10X has, uh, the third one here on the right, the NC2 um, platform uh, that we have or are close to be to releasing uh, from the acquisition of Redacore and Katana is coming. But what we have right now is the uh, single cell chromium single cell solution where you input single cell suspensions or nuclei suspensions from a variety of um, starting materials, whether it's tissue, frozen tissue, whether it's uh, cell cultures, um, et cetera. And then we have um, four main essays that you can actually plug into this uh, solution. And then we have our Visium spatial transcriptomic solution that is enabled for fresh frozen tissue sections as well as FFPE uh, tissue sections since recently for mouse and human. And that really just um, requires you to uh, run this on the Visium uh, glass slide. So there is no actual specific platform instrument required from 10X uh, to undertake this. So, Looking in at the Chromium single cell um, platform here, our Chromium controller, the size of a shoebox, so very small. So if you do get a chance to, to go into the facility um, and, and have a look, it's, it's really quite small and compact. It runs these eight channel um, microfluidic chips that you can see here, and we can plug in these four different types of assays. Um, onto the chip as, as needed. And as I said, it's an end-to-end -end workflow. Um, so you uh, prepare the, the cell suspensions or nuclear suspensions. And that is, as, as Lou mentioned in our very first um, uh, seminar series, you know, that is probably 85, 90, if not more percent of the experiment that you um, put the effort in to generate these cell suspensions and nuclear suspensions. And then uh, you load that onto uh, the microfluidic chip, the encapsulation there into the nanoliter droplets uh, with our 10X barcode gel beads really it only takes about 18 minutes, such a run. And then off the chip, you perform um, a, a series of um, uh, barcoding and, and library preparation steps. And that leaves you with um, Illumina compatible sequencing ready libraries. So they all have different, each essay has sort of different recommendations for sequencing and, and we can point those out uh, specifically uh, once you enter um, into one of these essays. Um, but what I want to highlight with this end-to-end -end workflow solution here is that we have the analysis software and the visualization software. So that cell ranger for single cell, space ranger for spatial and loop browser available for downloading for free, um, or you can utilize um, third party software tools as well. So it's, you're not locked in there. 
So here is at high level what occurs on, um, on these um, microphotic chips in our chromium single cell instruments. So what, what's really the core to this uh, gem technology, gel beads and emulsion where we input um, you know, millions of these 10X barcoded gel beads and we combine those with reagents needed, but of course with your um, sample single cell or single nuclei and encapsulate these um, uh, in the partitioning or surrounded by partitioning or about encapsulating these in the nanoliter droplets. Some of the key specs for this instrument um, are that you can run up to eight samples. So I mentioned there's eight channels. If you don't multiplex, um, 10X also has uh, the cellplex kit available to multiplex up to 12 samples. But the dy dynamic range here that I wanna mention starts from about 500 cells per channel up to 10,000 cells that you can capture in each um, individual lane. Um, we have a multiplet rate of about 0.8% per thousand cells. So that's something to keep in mind, specifically when you start multiplexing um, in sort of subsequent um, experiment as um, here, you know, those, the more cells you use, the higher the, the multiplets are that, that you are generating. And then we have a very high capture rate of um, up to 65%, depending on um, cell type and um, nucleus type that you're using. So for cancer specifically or for translational clinical research, these, um, this platform and the, the specific essays that you can plug in, um, you know, not only are sort of replacing slowly some of these uh, techniques um, that are currently being used, but you know, they, they complement, I think, data that's already being generated. So you can, um, with the single cell um, gene expression solution, you can capture the whole transcriptome. With the immune pro profiling solution, you can look at T and B cell receptors in um, you know, specific sequence and specific antigen um, interactions as well with our feature barcoding technology. Um, we enable um, shortly you know, high throughput protein screening and something that I want to go into a little bit today is the CRISPR screening, CRISPR perturbation screening that you can undertake with the three prime gene expression solution feature barcoding, as well as looking at chromatin structure with our attack seq assay. So all those, um, you know, really feed into some of these four main um, um, fields or, or questions that, that, that uh, researchers are asking in terms of identifying tumor heterogeneity, identifying uh, the tumor microenvironment, uh, you know, specifically looking into advancing immunotherapies by characterizing immune cell modulation and tumor progression. So in the field of immune uh, immuno-oncology and then uh, therapeutic development where uh, with the single cell data, you are um, enabling, you know, the discovery of new uh, novel therapeutic targets, for example, and can explore new um, um, modulate cell populations as well um, with these, uh, to just name a few here, pick, pick a few from these. So the majority of the examples um, out of these, I want to, I picked um, where groups have utilized the gene expression solution here um, with combined with the feature barcoding um, solution. So what that means at high level, I just want to explain here on this slide is that we first we capture the three prime gene expression. So we capture the three prime end from the mRNA uh, targets of the cell um, with our um, three prime gene expression gel beads, but that's not the only thing that you uh, can capture of each individual cell. Um, you can on top of this uh, look at cell surface protein expression, utilizing antibodies, uh, detecting the specific protein that you're interested in, um, and they have to be uh, conjugated with a small oligo uh, that can be captured in our biochemistry, so it will have to be complementary to one of our capture sequences um, on uh, the gel bead. 
in addition to uh, the cell surface protein, the three prime gene expression assay, as I mentioned, also enables um, CRISPR's perturbation screening. And how this works is that you would basically, in the design of the guide RNAs, incorporate the capture sequence one or capture sequence two in the stem or in the loop um, of the guide RNA. And then um, with that design, we are actually able to directly detect this <clears throat> in each per two cell at the end um, of your screen. So um, a specific examples here, beginning with um, looking at the tumor microenvironment, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, a colorectal cancer sample. We are looking here at 8,370 um, cells that we have uh, partitioned and analyzed using the three prime gene expression kit. And um, what you can see here is that a large number of cell clusters have been identified. Uh, these purple highlighted immune cells here have been um, annotated using the uh, gene expression markers that are published in, in databases. So we have not um, added in any cell surface um, markers here and specifically in this assay. Um, we can also identify you know, several different uh, tissue types. And uh, of course, we can also um, um, identify the, the tumor cells in this data set. So what this also shows is that um, amongst the large number of immune cells is um, that there is, um, because of the relatively large cell number that we are looking at here, that we can actually distinguish between the different types of T cells um, within this particular sample. Um, so that um, can be you know, a target for you to look at um, potentially what could be utilized for immunotherapy. Um, we can also look at um, tissue cells versus tumor cells to look at or identify biomarkers and drug targets. Um, and here, what is also visible within the B cells is that we see a clear differentiation of these B cells into plasma cells, suggesting a robust B cell response in this, tu in this tumor. So from those, um, just from the single uh, three prime gene expression run here, you can include um, a large number of potential um, targets uh, for therapy, for example, or for biomarker discovery. The next example here um, looks at the uh, single cell transcriptome network in uh, gastric pre-malignant lesions and early gastric cancer. Um, this um, here is a cell report from um, a, a group in China. They have utilized a three prime gene expression RNA sequencing here. And what we see here on the right is the expression profiles generated of uh, a bit more than 30, 32,000 um, cells, and they generated a cell atlas encompassing these pre-malignant and early malignant samples. So in the middle here, you can see uh, the mucosa biopsies they have collected and the different stages um, and how many, and that's, um, and then they have run this uh, using the, uh, the chromium controller. So in this large um, population here, they have um, identified very uh, small, uh, small group of cells that they were able to analyze further in subsequent studies that's not shown here. And they've commented, you know, that some of those were not um, able to be identified just use, uh, utilizing uh, bulk RNA sequencing experiments, which this, groups, uh, which this uh, group had conducted previously. Uh, to running these single cell uh, transcriptome analysis. So they were able to go ahead and then identify specific uh, genetic markers for potential clinical um, utility as, as diagnostic markers in, in this cancer type. This study here um, looked at, uh, again, just simply using the three prime gene expression solution to screen triple negative breast cancer patient derived xenograft models to understand the high variability in responses to EGFR therapy. <clears throat> so here we are actually only looking at uh, three and a half thousand cells from exceptional responder PDX 
um, from the ex exceptional responder PDX model. And um, in this, um, in this um, marked uh, highlighted black circle here, the authors identified subpopulations displaying distinct biological features, um, including a mesenchymal cluster, which highly expressed EGFR that functioned as, as tumor initiating cells. And that suggested to them that they could investigate this further to determine if these EGFR associated tumorogenicity tumor plays a role in the, in the predicted uh, treatment response for these um, cancer patients. Another application for the 3' gene expression solution is to look at um, underlying transcriptional, um, transcriptional mechanisms of um, immunotherapy resistance. And here in this example, the um, Hutch Hutchinson Cancer Research Center uh, um, published the, this data here that you see um, looking at Merkel cell carcinoma um, uh, uh, patients. And they've run here single cell RNA sequencing of tumor biopsies. In blue, you see uh, biopsies collected um, uh, uh, pre treatment, and then also um, biopsies collected after these patients had um, run into relapse. And you can see that, this, that there is a massive difference in expression between the different tumors. Um, and the authors looked into this further to understand what exactly is happening. And on the right here, they've picked <clears throat> specifically, or we are looking specifically here at the expression of HLA-B. Um, and what we can see here is that in the relapse um, a group of cells that is, is basically lost, the expression, the HLB, HLAB um, expression, um, which you know could explain why uh, the uh, immunotherapy resistance occurred. So they were not. They basically the tumor had basically uh, shut off transcriptionally the expression, and although the T cells uh, could still recognize the antigen, it could no longer be presented. So this um, was of particular interest for the group because the transcriptional HLA repression is reversible. Um, and so they're starting to look into, you know, how this could be um, prolonging the um, immune uh, therapy or the, the immune response um, in, these, in these particular patients and showing how here single cell really sort of provided that insight uh, to take this uh, research further. Next, I want to touch on, um, on CRISPR specific with an example on, on cancer immune therapy. And here on the right, what you can see uh, is just um, a graphic of uh, these capture sequences that I mentioned that have to be incorporated into the uh, guide RNA um, pool design. Uh, that you can then basically directly read um, with our three prime gene expression assay on the three prime uh, gel beads. So the, the CRISPR um, for the five prime immune profiling solution is coming uh, next year. Um, and the advantage here will be that you could already use um, existing uh, guide RNA pools. So you don't have to design new pools utilizing these um, these capture sequences as the, the sort of the capture, the target is, is going to work slightly differently. And um, utilizing CRISPR, what's the advantage of, of doing this CRISPR pertub perturbation screening with um, the 10X solution is there is a few um, advantages here that, that are listed on the right. And, and one of them is that it makes the, um, the workflow, it shortens the workflow uh, slightly. So it is faster than traditional screens, but it does um, depend on, you know, the, how quickly, I guess, your trans transduced cells um, are um, going to start expressing the guides. And then also, um, you know, how quickly will you be seeing these gene expression differences? But we have seen um, this, um, this time frame, you know, can be shortened uh, down to just a few days compared to like week long um, experiments um, previously. And then you do get a higher resolution with this, uh, with this um, type of analysis. And um, because you're uh, um, detecting directly 
the guide that's expressed in each of the cells and measure the gene expression changes directly in each cell, um, you get a much more um, direct uh, readout from, from a CRISPR screen. And this example here um, in cell um, highlights uh, how the CRISPR screen and the standard chromium uh, controller environment can be used um, in a screening primary immune function human T cells. And for this here specifically, um, the authors used um, a pool of 48 uh, guide RNAs uh, for, and, and transduced uh, human T cells from, from two, two uh, donors and ran that through uh, the chromium controller. And what we can see here on the top is looking at the uh, gene expression, the entire uh, gene expression captured from all the, uh, the T cells. And in the center, they have focused here on four specific genes that they were interested in and overlaid that. Um, and then on the right, we can see the clustering by cell states and that in total um, 13 different cell clusters, uh, were, uh, they were able to identify 13 um, clusters in this, in, this different, in this screen here. And out of the pool of 48, uh, the group was able to identify seven guide RNAs that can perturb regulators involved in cell cycle and T cell activation, and other processes critical for immune response. And that's um, showcased here in, in the center at the bottom, these seven guide RNAs uh, that they showed directly um, in this publication. And this here highlights for this particular study, how um, a, um, a fairly long uh, genome-wide CRISPR screen uh, could be sh shortened in this time, um, in this particular example here, down to nine days, and that they then also performed some in vitro testing down, down, um, downstream to confirm some of the findings uh, in, these public, in this um, study. So from this um, CRISPR screen is just one example. Uh, I now want to switch gear and lastly uh, give a couple of examples of uh, the spatial analysis in, in cancer and why location matters with um, the Visium spatial gene expression solution. And here we are looking on the left um, in a, on a, a tumor section that's been stained with um, HNE stain. And on the right, we are looking at tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And in this particular instance here, we are looking at, you know, are these um, lymphocytes successfully um, penetrating the tumor? And on the top, there's an example of a hot tumor where that has occurred, um, which relates to or, or means a good prognosis for this particular patient. And at the bottom in this example uh, of a tumor section stained with HNE as well, on the right, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are not infiltrating, are being um, held back, uh, which is representative of a cold tumor, which means poor prognosis um, for this particular patient. So um, here, you know, it showcases uh, quite nicely how um, the, the spatial context actually allows um, conclusions on, on prognosis, whereas uh, a single cell um, expression a profile would have just, you know, highlighted the presence of the, the, the lymphocytes rather than where the actual occurrence is. At high level, um, just wanted to um, showcase the, the workflow, um, specifically here for H&E um, and immunofluorescence, you can detect protein um, on the same section although only at this point was up to six. Um, we are limited to up to six and that's gonna be extended soon. But um, you capture four, uh, four um, tissue sections on one slide, you take an image and then uh, off the slide you perform, again, barcoding and library construction um, steps to um, generate a sequencing ready um, Illumina compatible library. So these workflows can be completed in one or two days, um, respectively, depending on whether you're using FFPE or fresh frozen. And with this slide, um, I just wanna highlight again, I'm sure you, you're all aware, um, but the resolution on our current um, Visium slides 
are about five to 10 cells. So we have each barcoded spot in, in the capture area uh, with a diameter of 55 micrometers in center to center of about 100 micrometers. And with the high throughput, so, uh, high um, definition HD solution that's coming, uh, that will be reduced down to five micrometers per spot. Um, so we'll bring this down to the single cell or subsingular sub cellular level. Uh, but of note also for the um, barcoded spots, we capturing a uh, polyadenylated um, RNA molecule uh, with this solution. And last, um, I have one example of utilizing the spatial gene expression to study mm -hmm. immune cell infiltration um, for HER2 positive breast uh, cancer samples uh, from the Star Life Lab um, and what they've performed here. Um, so if you're looking at um, one of these H and E stained section that the pathologist annotated, we can see, you know, the tumor um, invasive cancer cells, immune cells identified uh, versus normal glands, fat tissue, etc. And then we are looking now at the gene expression heat map generated uh, from the Visium um, solution and um, that they have performed here on top they sort of did a um, uh, that's the total immune score so they've um, generated um, a scoring system to highlight um, sort of the intensity of expression that they that they um, detected and then on the right here uh, they were looking at uh, these specific uh, immune cells that were identified based on their gene expression and where within the tissue uh, the expression was um, highest so you can see this with this um, distribution here so when we look at the memory b cells in the heat map in the center and then we look at on the right where where uh, the expression exactly occurs um, and for the T cells, I think uh, what, what the highlight here was or the, the, um, the additional knowledge that they gained from the gene expression slide was that the, uh, the T um, upper two cells were expressed in immune, cell, in immune cells, not only, but also they were noticed in the fibrous tissue, in the invasive cancer and in the tumor stroma, et cetera. So they were actually present um, in a lot more um, of the areas than, than it was annotated by the pathologist. And lastly, what you can do with this is you can also generate a 3D uh, view of this, um, of these serial sections of tumors um, and look at specific um, gene expression, um, the, the signatures of these tumors and these 3D models. So with that, um, I'll hand over to Dan. We'll take questions at the end. And thanks for your attention. Okay. All right. I'm hoping everyone can see that. Um, thanks, uh, Yvonne and David and, and the rest of 10X for uh, putting this together and asking me to share some of our work. Um, so today I'll talk a bit about um, our work in understanding drug resistance in um, a childhood cancer called neuroblastoma. Um, so this is works unpublished and a bit of a work in progress, but it kind of proves some of the, the concepts in terms of the power of the single cell work and, um, and the utility of the 10X equipment. Um, so just quickly, because Yvonne mostly covered this, but just to highlight again, that uh, cancer really is a multicellular disease. You have uh, uh, clearly lots of inf infiltrating um, normal cells within a tumor microenvironment that are very relevant to the prognosis and biology of, of the cancer. Um, but even, of course, within the cancer cells um, that you have um, a, a, a huge range of heterogeneity um, that is important, very important in terms of therapeutic response. So this heterogeneity in the cancer cells can have a genetic basis, um, of course, and uh, that is either genetic aberrations or mutations um, that can drive kind of 
uh, functional uh, differences in cells. Um, but there's also a non-genetic uh, basis for uh, tumor heterogeneity, which mostly we'll focus on today. Um, but essentially they both lead to a similar thing which is the change in function of these cells so that they firstly are cancer cells, but, um, but also important, uh, as I've said, in terms of drug resistance and, and treatment failure and many other facets of um, uh, cancer biology. And of course, single cell technologies like Tenex are really under, are beginning to understand this stuff uh, in very high level detail. So <clears throat> since most of the talk will be about drug resistance, I thought I'd just start with um, a couple of the sort of key concepts of at least non-genetic drug resistance um, here, which is highlighted in this nice uh, review paper recommend reading, uh, two concepts, one described as transcriptional priming, um, where a cell type has a unique advantage, allows it to survive treatment, in this case, the yellow cell, um, and then subsequently kind of expand to become a, a resistant cell type in that tumor. So that's a kind of a pretty simple concept of um, a clonal selection where one cell type survives effectively. Um, so that's referred to as transcriptional priming. Um, and then, but probably a kind of more realistic um, uh, idea of how cells are actually functioning is, is the transcriptional adaptation. Um, so this is really comes down to the ability of cells to be plastic or change their phenotype at any given time. So in this figure, it kind of highlights that a cell or cell types can kind of change their function and adapt to and fro. And this is escape and escape mechanism. So you expose them in a particular environment like drugs or chemotherapy at, at high levels. They have the ability to change their phenotype, allow that short-term survival and then ultimately resist and, and um, progress in, in, in the tumour, um, where, again, the cells can go to and fro between their phenotype, depending on what's kind of most favourable to their survival. So this is a kind of problem when we, we're using single cell data to understand um, mechanisms. And... So often we'll be faced with an issue with single cell data where um, we can't really determine whether it's a, a mechanism by transcriptional priming or transcriptional adaptation. So this is the kind of thing, or actually a much more simplified version of, but um, a kind of thing that we'd be faced with. A, a pre-treated on the left showing single cells and five cell types and a post-treated sample that kind of enriches this one, one cell type um, as an example. So if we show that schematically, you can kind of see on the right that the, clearly the blue cell is the surviving cell, right? So this is an example of, of course, transcriptional priming. One cell has a, or cell type has an advantage, allows survival and tolerance against the, the drug action, and then ultimately expansion. Um, but consider a, a kind of real world scenario where actually you're getting multiple um, mechanisms underlying drug resistance where sure you may have transcriptional priming you've got the one strong cell but it's also of course possible that cell types uh, can change and adapt by plasticity mechanisms so in this case you may have for instance the yellow and the green cell type having adaptive um, capacity to kind of generate this post-treated um, resistant cell type um, so, of course, given normal single cell data, we really can't determine how these are these occurring, whether it's a, a priming adaptation or a combination of both mechanisms. Um, so that's where uh, um, lineage tracing comes in. So the principle of lineage tracing is really just to mark the, the individual cells before treatment here. So if we add a kind of mark or tag. In this instance, we're just referring to it as the A tag. We can actually trace then that A expanded in response to treatment. Whereas C, it, it may not have expanded, but it's actually then changed its cell type. So we can determine then that that um, mechanism is by adaptation and similarly for lineage D here. So that's kind of example of why we want to use lineage tracing for um, drug resistance studies. 
So the actual method we used was developed by Samantha Morris called cell tagging. Um, and the principle of cell tagging is that in the three prime UTR of GFP, you have this eight base pair randomer, or so what she refers to as the cell tag. So a library of these GFP molecules is transduced into cells um, and the combination of these, these um, barcodes in cells then can kind of mark their lineage um, because they're heritable. Once the cell receives the cell tag, um, divides and expands, you're kind of creating these lineages based on these unique um, combinations of, of these actual cell tags. And I guess the nice thing about this technology that extends upon kind of more um, of the older versions of lineage tracing is this is from an expressed molecule. So GFP is expressed, it's in the mRNA molecule, we can detect it using single cell RNA sequencing. So we get, of course, the lineage, which is our objective, but at the same time, we get whole transcriptome of that same cell. So we understand the whole transcriptome of the cell, but at the same time, the interconnections of the cell lineages. And Sam um, very nicely demonstrated this technology in uh, cell reprogramming in um, her paper a couple of years ago, um, where she was not for cancer, but for reprogramming, cell reprogramming, she used this to track um, the reprogramming of certain lineages from a fibroblast to what she calls an induced endodermal progenitor. And she highlighted two major trajectories, one which was kind of inefficient and one which was efficient and um, subsequently used that information to the, the genetic features of the efficient reprogrammer to uh, improve reprogramming. So the actual application of that was really nice as well. Um, so but coming back to neuroblastoma, um, I won't go into the biology too much, but um, it's a kid's cancer, as I said, of the peripheral nerves um, and a kind of uh, a range of responses in, in patients. And it's becoming quite clear that the, the patients that respond poorly have uh, heterogeneous disease. So we and others have started looking at this using single cell work um, and effectively to summarize quite a lot of work we've, we've we describe three main cell types, the, an adrenergic cell type, a mesenchymal cell type, and what we refer to as a transitional cell type. So, but I guess the major outcome of our work and others is that we really um, don't know the interconnections between these cells. So it, it's theorized that they um, transdifferentiate between these cell states and, and cell plasticity is, is important. Um, so, we wanted to do this with cell tagging, so we needed a cell system for that. Um, fortunately, there's a pretty well-known neuroblastoma cell line called SKNSH. Um, and in this case, you can see here, this is the single cell RNA data showing high expression of each one of those cell type signatures. So we got the adrenergic signature more highly expressed here, transitional signature more highly expressed here and mesenchymal. So they're, they're pretty exclusive of each other, these, these signatures. So uh, supporting the idea that the kind of a continuum of expression for cells adapting um, and supporting uh, kind of the idea that there's a good cell system is that the, the clustering kind of conform nicely to these adrenergic transitional and mesenchymal cell types all within one cell line. Um, so to depict this a little bit cleaner, and I'll be using a lot of these in the talk, we've used these ternary plots. So effectively, we're, all we're doing is summarizing each cell according to the expression of the, the three signatures. So this is a three coordinate system where cells can exist anywhere between adrenergic um, and mesenchymal cell types or, or it, it in between towards the kind of transitional cell type. So the colouring here just indicating where they fit in that spectrum. So we cell tagged this SKNSH cell line um, and then uh, what we had to do first, though, was we transduced the cells with the cell tag library, subcloned only 250 of the cells because we didn't want too many lineages. It would have been too hard to track with um, the single cell RNA sequencing. We expanded those 250 cells into, into a, a maximum of 250 lineages within that culture and then used um, the 10x to do the single cell RNA sequencing. So this is some of the... Um, the data just to show that we were able to detect um, cell tags 
Um, and on the left here is just a correlation plot between um, cell tag expression profiles where if they had high correlations like these dark blue boxes here, we were able to call them in that they had a, they formed a clone or a lineage um, and, and the color just indicating the different clones that we were able to call from that. And you can see there's the kind of wide range of sizes and that that's highlighted here that of our sort of top 50, I think there's 56 clones. Um, we had ranges of 400 cells uh, right down to 10 cells per clone. And this kind of arises because of the sort of variable trend, um, uh, proliferation rates of, of, of cells once we expand them. But still, we'll, these were the high confidence clones. We actually got a, quite a lot more, but we prefer to stick to the, um, the, the, those which we're very confident that they actually do form a separate clone. And on the right here, we can see the distribution and not that I really want you to see anything in particular here other than that the clones are kind of pretty randomly distributed or at least di diversely distributed, meaning we could already tell here that within individual clones, there was a spread of transcriptomes suggesting the cells uh, spontaneously adapt their phenotype. Um, but our main purpose was to understand drug resistance mechanisms. So we undertook this um, pretty simple experiment um, where we treated these SKNSH cells with the DMSO vehicle or uh, chemotherapy, uh, very well-known chemotherapy cisplatin, which is used in neuroblastoma, but of course, many other cancers. Um, DMSO just acts as the control here in the vehicle. We wanted to include this to control for the natural proliferation of the cells. Um, but we took these five samples um, and did the 10X um, based single cell RNA sequencing on that. So to step you through the data in terms of how the uh, transcriptome looks, we use the ternary plots as I described before. So this just shows the untreated sample and 24 hours of DMSO or 120 hours of DMSO. And, and um, thankfully the actual vehicle didn't change the transcriptome terribly much at all. So that, that was good that the control wasn't really um, causing any aberrant effects. But with cisplatin, it was really quite an obvious shift, um, which was great for our purposes. And um, it, it, at least at the five day mark, you could really see a pretty strong shift towards the mesenchymal pole where they sort of started over here as a mixture between adrenergic or transitional cells and maybe slightly mesenchymal uh, and really ended up very mesenchymal in nature. And to summarize, the, at least at the sample level, what's going on, Again, the, each one of these dots corresponds to just the average of the individual sample. You can't see terribly much difference with the DMSO, but you get this really obvious shift to, or trajectory towards the mesenchymal pole with treatment. But of course, the cell tags allow us to pull out the individual lineages, which is our main purpose here. And, um, and this then also shows us our ability to quantify the proportion of um, of each sample that is occupied by those um, those lineages or clones. And um, so here's kind of complicated plot, but effectively, um, if you focus on the cisplatin treated samples here, we see these subclones in purple or lineages in purple, which obviously are expanding. Uh, they're becoming much more prominent feature of the whole population after cisplatin treatment. And on the flip side, you get these cisplatin depleted clones as well. So ones that, so there seems to be at least two, two types of clones in this case where one which is naturally enriched or kind of tolerant or resistant to cisplatin um, and those which are depleted or sensitive to cisplatin. So to step you through um, the, the lineage analysis or the, the transcriptomic change of individual lineages or subclones, um, I'll, I'll just base it on increasing levels of complexity. So again, just showing you the sample level trajectories as described before, we get this cis, cis pattern um, shift. Now this is comparing the um, cis pattern depleted versus cis pattern enriched clones. And, and it's kind of interesting that both clone types want to shift towards the mesenchymal. Um, and so there's, there's clearly a cis patterns driving mesenchymal changes in all of these cells. Um, but the, 
the difference was the kind of starting point. So those those um, clones which were enriched or resistance to cisplatin kind of started more to the top of this triangle uh, or ternary plot. And whilst only occupying a min minority of the population to begin with, ended up expanding to become a majority. And, and so it was really um, a stark difference in terms of their change in proportion, but not a huge difference in terms of their trajectory. They just sort of started at a slightly different point, um, the enriched first depleted. But of course, you know, we were really interested in the individual um, clones. And so this is a bit of a mess and not really expecting you to see anything much more than what I described on this section, but uh, we can see all the individual trajectories that the, the clones can take can be really quite diverse. So that was our best attempt at summarizing it, um, but it's still interesting to note that some clones really do have kind of strange trajectories with, in response to cisplatin, really to us at least highlighted um, how um, diverse or variable responses of cells can be to chemotherapy. So again, just highlighting probably the key difference we could see though um, was the, the, the starting point or another way of saying that is that the cells were transcriptionally primed, meaning they had pre-existing characteristics uh, or these enriched clones had pre-existing characteristics that allowed um, cisplatin resistance. So just quickly to, to look at this quantitatively, we described them in terms of a transcriptional primary score where they can fit within this kind of spectrum from adrenergic to mesenchymal, and then looked at that in relation to their relative cisplatin enrichment. And, and you can see it was a pretty nice correlation. So it was really quite predictive where a clone falls in terms of this transcriptional primary score is, is strongly predictive of whether it's going to be enriched or depleted of, um, by cisplatin. And of course, what are the genes? And, and we could look at this using now parallel transcri transcriptomic data. Um, and we compared cisplatin and rich um, clones versus depleted clones and could see features of sort of mesenchymal stem cell cells, I guess you could say, or, or neural progenitors. And um, some interesting genes of note for cancer reaches is EGFR um, and some of these stemness factors or progenitor factors, ACL1 is well known in, in neuroblastoma development, uh, sorry, sympathoadrenal development. But then you also have the, these genes featuring kind of sympathetic neurons or, or differentiated phenotypes that in the depleted clones. And, and indeed, where we looked at the pathway analysis, we were able to see that the main feature that predicted cisplatin enrichment was really a, a stop in differentiation. So negative re re regulation of neuron differentiation here, et cetera, contrasting to de the depleted clones, which is promoting differentiation or features of neuro neuronal kind of cells here. Um, so just finally, just to summarize that this is just all work in one cell line. And of course we want to extend this and make it more generalized, but this is what we've done so far to to, to learn whether this is just a more general feature in terms of drug resistance. We created a gene signature from those genes that I mentioned in the last slide and explored that gene signature in the genomics and drug sensitivity um, database, which has screened 23 neuroblastoma cell lines by 179 drugs. And down the bottom here, you can see that the IC50 of those individual um, cell lines to cisplatin uh, is positively correlated with the cisplatin resistance signature. So these genes seem to predict the, the resistance in, in many cell lines, at least by this, this bulk data that we have here. And kind of interestingly also that other chemotherapies in the, in, um, that are used in neuroblastoma are also this positive correlation. So these genes, we would uh, hypothesize at least are predicting general um, resistance to chemotherapy. So with that, just a quick summary, we saw um, two cell types really uh, exhibited in this cell line. Um, the sympathetic neuron or chromaffin cells, which is the major population, is primed for drug sensitivity and was plastic, but not very efficiently. Uh, the sympathetic progenitor, which is a minor population before treatment, but it is primed for drug resistance, has efficient plasticity, really converted to the mesenchymal um, pole quite well. Um, and then when we add cisplatin, we really, all cells are adapting. So it's not just like 
a simple concept of one, only one strong cell type, we're kind of getting priming plus adaptation. Um, so uh, really these mesenchymal derivatives have features of uh, EMT maybe, or potentially de-differentiation. Um, so I, I guess a highlight of the work was that transcriptional priming and adaptation are not mutually exclusive. We would argue in this case that um, our cells are primed to adapt better, put it that way, as a survival mechanism, these sympathetic progenitors. We're interested in looking at drugs, of course, as a potentially targeted agent to overcome this, um, and then interested whether this is a, just a short-term effect or whether if we remove drugs, would they therefore revert phenotype? There are lots of questions around how, how this relates to actually a patient tumour. So. Uh, with that, I'd just like to thank my contributors, in particular the team at CCI, who undertook all the lab work here, um, my colleagues here at UTS, and um, Sam Morris in uh, Washington University for the development of the cell tags and the funding bodies. And thanks very much for listening. We can't hear you, David. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's just me, but I can't hear you, David, so. Me neither, David. I can't hear you either. Yeah. Well, I guess maybe we just open the floor to questions then, right? If there's anyone from the audience or um, on the panel, any questions? Still can't hear you, David. There's no questions in the chat. I could start with a question for you, Yvonne, if you like. All right. Um, yeah, I was kind of interested in the in the CRISPR work and um, I mean I see the advantages in terms of scale and, and a unique kind of output uh, and we're, we're particularly interested in this but one of our objectives is to look at combinations of CRISPR perturbations in the same cell so which, which I, I see is possible using this technology but maybe um, an issue in terms of of numbers, like in terms of how many cells you would have to look at and how few um, guide RNAs you'd have to look at. But do you have any comments on kind of the feasibility of, of um, those sorts of experiments? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So with the, I guess with a 10,000 per lane, um, you are a bit limited, right? In the number of guides uh, you can look at. Um, we also, you know, recommend a, a sort of a minimum number of cells per guide as well to actually make a meaningful or generate meaningful data. But if you are interested in larger numbers of guides, um, I think the the Chromium X with a higher throughput might actually be a better option for that. So it's, I guess, specifically designed uh, to run more cells, um, enabling, you know, larger, larger throughput CRISPR screen. Um, so I don't know what, what you had in mind. Um, I think what the paper that I showed there with 48 guides, that's probably around the number that what's feasible in with the Chromium standard chromium controller run anything higher than that uh you know either you, you run several several chips or you combine it on a 
um, high throughput screen on the Chromium X. I'm sorry, my internet just cut out in the middle of that uh, answer there. But yeah, I, I was understanding that um, mostly what you were saying was that it, you really just need to cre increase throughput to account for that kind of uh, random association of multiple guides per cell, right? Yes, um, and you know, I've, uh, the, the Chromium X with the high throughput um, reagents, we basically screen like twice as many cells per lane. Um, would make that a bit easier, right? Rather than, I guess, running several uh, chips on the Chromium controller. But yeah, basically that's what you'd need, higher numbers. Um, and I was asking, I don't know if you've, if you've cut out then or, or got back in, but uh, the publication that I showed where they had about 48 guides that they used, that's sort of the number, um, I think the highest, I think we've actually we've actually seen 80 with the Chromium controller, um, but that's probably the top end of guides that you can use. Yeah, I see. I see. Thank you. Um, can you hear me now? Yay! Oh, sorry for that. Um, I'm back. Um, sorry, I couldn't introduce you, Dan, properly because I think my my uh, microphone was off. At in the middle so anyway no worries all good um so well i'm i'm, I'm aware of the time but um uh so thank you thank you both for um for being here today and for your talk uh dan i think that uh, you're showing very interesting data um i actually have a question for you like if if, if everybody wants to stay um, a few seconds more uh i'd like to ask you have you tried you know like the ternary plots that you're showing to infer trajectories uh, based on your signatures, but have you tried to do an unbiased trajectory analysis or unsupervised trajectory analysis to look at whether you know there's multiple fates within those ones? Because sort of you're defining those three states that you were showing based on, on, on previous biologies. That is there anything else that you can predict uh, that is not being shown before? Perhaps you know multiple. Uh, missing camel subtypes or subclasses yeah well i mean um well i mean we've looked at trajectories in terms of say a umap and in terms of like our main that ternary plot is really just a compromise of us trying to simplify the biology enough to show trajectories that are meaningful but you're right that um the it, taking an unbiased approach, I mean, we effectively see the same thing as the trajectories in terms of the shift towards the mesenchymal arm now, but the actual um, exact pathway that that is undertaken, we the best we could simplify it was those that are enriched versus those that were depleted in terms of the, the subclones. But um, I think really, if we look at individual clones, we see, see quite diverse patterns. And um, so I'm, I'm not sure we could, um, easily say it's a different mesenchymal subtype or or not because one of the one of the things that's hard to highlight in the data that all all of the kind of average or the centroids that we show for the clones are made up of you know up ten to hundreds of cells and those cells also have spread or plasticity so even within a single you know sample there's spread and um, it it, it it definitely has discrete patterns, but you wouldn't say necessarily that they're exactly all falling where the centroid is. That's just our best way of summarizing the trajectory. So I think there's a lot lot to that in the sense of um, drug escape mechanisms that really mm -hmm. cells can react in pretty, um, you know, weird and wonderful ways to, to any environmental exposure. And for cancer, that kind of means cells find a way to survive. And um, but it'd be interesting to see where we can use this information to actually help us choose better therapies, you know, at least to, to even just illustrate the mechanism that we can either prime cells to, to be sensitive to other drugs or just use that known heterogeneity to, um, to, uh, to, to choose uh, combinations of drugs or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah, that um, sounds like a very good way to understand that. So it's, it's great. To see this technology so Daniel, on, on, on that on the nodes on the node of the trajectory
Okay, so so when you when you do your analysis, what what makes you select the trajectory algorithm over a velocity? So the trajectory will not tell you what direction, it will just tell you, you know the path, but it will not tell you what direction is going. Right? So where the velocity yep. will allow you that. So and the underlying idea is the same, but one you have direction and the other is just kind of you know the biology, you put the direction. Yeah. So it, even if we looked at the probably easiest way to look at that particular problem is just look at the untreated sample by itself. And because then there's no strong exp environmental exposure like the drugs, which are driving change anyway. And, and when we did that, um, you kind of show a RNA velocity trajectory that that has a root in the those transitional cells. So they have the capacity to differentiate down either pole and um, in terms of directionality. And so we see, well, yeah, I'm calling them transitional cells, probably not the most accurate name. And in, in, we're just calling them probably more like progenitor cells and um, and that they're, they're the kind of root of differentiation and, and uh, which spontaneously goes down towards um, the EVA pole. Um, but even with therapy, of course, that's really driving a push towards the mesenchymal pole. It shows that the trajectory can, can maybe differ to that um, uh, uh, base or, or, or steady state trajectory. So my feeling is that the cells can move um, in, many which, in many directions. and. Um, and it really, uh, I think uh, we will try and learn about directionality in, in response to the drugs also using RNA velocity is probably a good idea and things like that. But we can at least know that that's time point data. We know time zero versus time five, that the trajectory yeah, therefore yeah, exactly. is in that direction. Yeah, so. Right. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm you know, causes of the time. And I would like to thank the speakers, Yvonne and, and, and Daniel uh, for, uh, um, you know, the insights on, on this uh, cancer biology and, and translational oncology. And also Lou for joining us and Karen for organizing all the, you know, um, logistics around the meetings and the uh, materials for promotion. So thank you very much, uh, everybody. And I'll see you uh, in two weeks time. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye.